In this tutorial, I'm going to be taking you through all you need to know about the basic gameplay mechanics in Still Division 2. If you are still unfamiliar with the menus and everything the game has to offer, make sure to check out my Getting Started tutorial, I'll leave a link in the description. Welcome to Steel Division 2. Today I'm going to be going through the basic gameplay mechanics, so let's jump into solo skirmish and set up a game versus the AI. I'm going to be playing my favourite division currently, the Gruppe Turin, and I'll set up the AI to play the 14th Infantry, which is a well-rounded Axis division. We'll keep the difficulty on medium and we'll just launch straight in. On a side note, massive thanks to members of my Discord for helping me plan this video. So here we are in the game, let's get started. First of all, camera movement. In order to pan the camera in Steel Division 2, just use W, A, S and D. You can set it in the options so that you can move your mouse to the side of the screen in order to scroll, but I would recommend staying away from that. In order to zoom, it's simply using your scroll wheel, zoom in and out, and if you have your cursor over a unit when the game is running, you can lock to that unit and follow it, which is really cool. Furthermore, if you hold down your middle mouse button, you can rotate your camera and also change the pitch of the camera in order to get really good looking angles. Next up, let's go through the UI. So in the top left, we have our deployment menu. The number on the left hand side is requisition points. This is the number of points you have to spend on units. To the right of that you have the income countdown and your income. So the income countdown at default is 60 seconds and every 60 seconds you will get that number of income which will add that to your current requisition point pool. Underneath that you have this list of types of unit. If you click on them, it will reveal the units available in your battle group. If you can't see this menu, make sure to click on where you have your requisition points. Now just going over the unit cards briefly, in the top left we have the requisition points cost of the unit, so how much you are going to have to spend in order to bring it in. Underneath you have the number of those units available. Underneath that you have the nation's flag of the unit and underneath that a specialized icon based on what they do. If you hover over it there is tooltips for most things. And you have the name and on the right hand side for some units you have a veterancy as well. On the right hand side of our UI we have the mini map. You can see the front line here as well as all of the small circles representing the flags that you can see on the map. Underneath the mini map we have the current phase which we are in, so it always starts at phase A, and the remaining time for said phase. Underneath that we have all the information about who is playing, what divisions they are playing, what their division income is or deployment type, and the number of objectives owned on each side. If one team owns more flags than the other, then the team behind will lose tickets. Tickets are represented by the bar to the right side of the objective's captured number. You win in every game mode by depleting your opponent's tickets. Once I start the game, it will become more clear. Finally, in the bottom right of the UI, we have the orders menu. This will show you all of the orders available to the current unit selected. You can then click on the orders to enact them. I would, however, recommend continuing to watch this video and learn some of the hotkeys, which will make your gameplay experience a lot smoother and a lot more fun in the long run. Then on top of the orders menu, we have the button for line of sight, which I will show later as well as the buttons for pings or beacons. Now these are useful in multiplayer for communicating between players, but they can also be used to ping positions on the map or units that you see in order to remind you of their location in the future. For example, 
If you spot an anti-tank gun and wish to bomb it later on, then put a ping on it. So it will remind you where the AT gun is next time you have a bomber available. Bear in mind the AT gun might have moved, but will give you a general sense of where you should be looking. You can have a maximum of four pings on the map at a time. In order to remove your ping, either wait for it to time out or right click on it, and that will remove it from your screen. So I'm going to quickly talk about how the game mode works and then we'll get some units down on the ground. So in the center, you'll see this line. This is the front line. If you move a unit towards it, you will push the front line forwards unless there are enemy units on the other side of the line. The idea of the game is to push your front line over the objectives in order to capture them. There are some units that do not affect the front line. Those are recon and generally small two-man squads, but some do, some don't. So that's something you're going to have to learn as you go along. One more thing worth mentioning is on the right hand side here you do have speed controls but these are only available in single player. With all that out of the way let's finally get some units down. So we have to place our units in our deployment zone at the start of the game that is the slightly darker zone on the map. This will disappear when the game starts. In different game modes they might be larger, especially on Breakthrough for example, the Defender gets a very large deployment zone. In regards to deployment, after the game starts, units placed on the map will arrive from the closest reinforcement point, shown by the large arrows on the edge of the map when you zoom out. Let's select our unit. I'm going to bring in a T-34-76 Fred Fedka, which is a recon tank, and place it down on the field. I'm going to accompany it with a leader tank another T-3476, and four more T-3476-1943s. Let's do the same again on the right-hand side here. Select one of each of the recon and leader units, and then what you may have noticed is I've placed down multiple in one go. In order to do that, what you want to do is hold Shift and then just left-click as many times as you want to bring in a unit. That is 12 T-34-76s, and you can see I've used up a rather sizable chunk of my requisition points in the top left. Another thing you may have noticed is the positioning of my units. I've placed all of my units on a road. Now this is because every unit in Steel Division has an on-road and off-road speed. Their on-road is almost always faster than their off-road speed. And at the start of the game, you're going to be rushing to put influence on the front line in the center here. And in order to be the fastest at doing so, you're going to have to use roads. So I went ahead and added a few more units on the field. I added two more anti-tank guns and an infantry squad to both of these columns. Now how do we give orders to our units? Well, what you want to do is left click on the unit you want to give an order to and then you select one of the orders from the bottom right or you can simply right click to give a move order. Now in order to show the order of the unit you currently have selected, hold shift. You can also do this if you have multiple units selected and have also given them orders. You just see all of the orders that are currently ongoing. You see that I've also selected this fourth tank which doesn't have an order and therefore is not showing one. Really good way at a glance to see what's going on. And let's go through all of the orders in the bottom right and their hotkeys to get you guys started. So, the first one is Hunt. Hunt is Steel Division 2's equivalent of attack move. The reason it's called Hunt is because units will try and use cover as well in order to get to their position. So I've currently got this tank on a, a normal move command. If I give it a hunt command using the default key which is Q, that will give it a hunt command and it will attempt to probably go through the light cover here in order to get to this position. And 
Then, if it sees any enemies along the way, will stop and shoot. So that's very important to know. It will stop and then shoot. Next to that, we have the move fast command. By default, the hotkey is F. If you want to get somewhere quickly, this is the command you want to use. So if I, for example, want to get across this bridge, I press F over here, and that will give a fast move command. When the game starts, it will likely make the tank follow the road all the way down here, take a left, and then go right across the bridge. That's because it will be the fastest way due to having a faster on-road speed. The thing that makes it different from a normal move command is that a normal move command will just drive straight to the location. A fast move command will probably follow the road and then take a left in order to get there. Then we have the reverse command. By default, this is G. The way you want to use reverse is by generally reversing the opposite direction from an enemy unit, especially if it's threatening to your armor. So this is generally used for facing tanks towards AT guns or enemy tanks. So say we have an AT gun over here in these trees and my T-34 is here. I want to place the reverse command behind the tank in the opposite direction so that the tank then faces its front armor towards the anti-tank gun. Then we have the stop command. This will cancel all orders and the tank will simply stop. On the next line we have fire position. This is by default T. This is generally used for bombers and artillery in order to fire at units which are not in your direct line of sight. Then on the right hand side we have return fire. Basically they won't fire unless they're fired at. The applications for this I'll go over in the advanced tutorial. Then we have quick hunt. This is the same as move fast except from the moved fast order will have the same characteristics as the hunt order. So whilst using the roads like a move fast order you will also stop and fire at anything you see along the way. It has the same look as an attack move order when you press shift. I'll set one of them to do an attack move and I'll have the one behind it use a quick hunt order and you'll see the difference. Then finally there is the efficient shot command which is control H. This orders a unit to hold its fire until it has at least 40% chance to hit and penetrate a target. Again something that I'll cover more in the advanced tutorial. Now that's all of the orders for tanks. Other units have more orders. So it's not over yet. For example, my anti-tank gun here which comes in a jeep. There are a couple more orders you may have noticed. We have auto cover which is used for toggling on and off whether or not you want this unit to automatically move into the closest cover. If the unit in question is a vehicle it can only move into light cover uh, if it is however an infantry unit or a support weapon like an anti-tank gun then it can also hide in heavy cover and will do so by default if the uh, option is selected that is unload at position is by default y and this is a command you're going to be wanting to use quite a lot because it basically combines the move fast and unload commands in one nice friendly command. So for example I want to unload this infantry squad in this building for example. I can simply press Y it will then move fast to that location and unload. The unload command is however useful on its own. So for example if you are using a unload at position command all the way up here but you start getting fired on and want to unload early, selecting the unit and pressing U will unload the unit immediately, which is very, very useful. It will just stop and unload straight away. There are some more orders, like smoke orders and stuff for artillery, but we'll get to that once the game started. 
So now what I'm going to do is give all of my units orders and then I'll go through them with you guys and explain exactly why I've given each order so you guys have an understanding of where to use them and when. So I've placed my orders, let's go through them. So all of my tanks here I've given a quick hunt order towards the enemy flag on the opposite side of the bridge. The intention being for them to use the road to get there as quickly as possible and fire at anything they find along the way. Meanwhile I have my AT guns and infantry on unload at position orders on the left hand side. Now you may wonder why I selected these particular positions. Well this is where I'm going to introduce you to one of the best tools in Steel Division 2 the line of sight tool. If you hold C you will see the line of sight from your cursor or if you have a unit selected or have got a unit hovered over the line of sight from that unit. You can also check line of sight from particular buildings for example. Now this is great for determining the best place to put things like AT guns, infantry and all that jazz. So over on this left hand side I've placed an AT gun here because it has an ideal line of sight against units coming up this hill across the bridge. So any enemy vehicles that try and make a run up this road will get shot. As you can see the line of sight covers that road. All of the area in red cannot be seen. Then I've placed an infantry unit in here. Again a nice building because it cannot be seen too far over this area so it can't be suppressed from any units over here but can still provide fire onto this road and the area nearby. Then I also placed an AT gun over here because from this tree line you have nice line of sight covering both this road and this road. Over on the right hand side we have a couple more AT guns that I placed in unloaded position orders with the infantry and again it's all to do with line of sight. So this one able to cover the ridge of the hill there as well as this road from that position. And then I've also got one that's going to be going up the hill here placing itself in the light cover in order to cover this road. So it's very important to use the line of sight tool to determine the best places to put your units. It may take quite a bit of getting used to and there are a lot of maps to learn so bear that in mind. But I'll do my best to help you guys out with that as I go along in my gameplay videos and all that kind of stuff. One more thing before we start the game. I just wanted to go over different terrain types. So here for example you can see heavy forest and this gives us a green cursor if we mouse over it. What that means is heavy cover. If for example we hover our mouse over these light forests then it gives us sort of light cover and that gives us less of a defensive bonus than heavy cover. Also heavy cover conceals units better than light cover. Furthermore vehicles cannot move into heavy cover but can move into light cover buildings act as heavy cover and there are also swamps and impassable terrain but I'm not sure if we have any swamps on this map but for example the river is impassable however there will be areas where infantry can cross and ford the river but vehicles cannot unless they have the amphibious trait that includes support weapons actually as well but swamps are a good example of where infantry can go but vehicles cannot. Every map has a number of these features that you should probably look out for before you start the game. Hills in particular are very important to take care of because for example from this position our enemy can fire 2000 meters towards our objective. So if a tiger were to turn up on top of this hill we'd be in a pretty bad position at a distance. Time to start the battle. I'm going to go ahead and put the battle to half speed for the time being so I can show you guys how the orders have adapted to what we've given. So the unload at position orders you can see are following the road as fast as they can to the location and then they'll unload. 
we have the quick hunt command that is following the road up and to the left and then to the right as I suggested it would and then we have this one tank using a hunt order and you can see he's moving considerably slower than the rest of the T-3476 is and attempting to move through cover in order to get to his position. If I change this order to a control F quick hunt order he will then jump onto the road and join his fellow comrades in the charge towards glory. Let's speed things back up again see if we can find ourselves some enemies. Now as our units move towards this front line you can see that we've put influence onto the front line and as our front line goes over a flag we'll capture that flag. Some infantry have arrived. I'm going to use a unload at position command. Let's do that. Next to this a T gun so that we can defend it. Meanwhile in the center a unit has come all the way through and on the left hand side they've already pushed a unit across. And that's because they're using a lot of units in very fast vehicles. So for example we have these half tracks and half tracks are great because they're armored and therefore are immune to light arms fire but because they are a half track they're much slower on road than say a jeep is and they've used jeeps to get infantry right up close and personal from the start. What I'm going to do here is just press U in order to unload my Strelke DP here and engage the Grenadier DP on the right hand side. You can see all of my tanks currently trying to complete their quick hunt orders but are stopping to fire as this Kubel MG goes past. But this gives me a good example of how you can engage enemy units if you simply left click on the unit you have and right click on the enemy unit uh, they will engage. Now this is a good ranged engagement for my Strelke DP. We have two machine guns and nine SVTs perfect for the medium range engagement. The Stostrup with MP44s here are decent but they're completely outmanned. I'm going to try and take them out and in order to leave this location and move over to the other side of the map because you can see there is plenty going on here I'm going to give a hunt command so that guy will move over here I'm then going to give him a command to move up to this position if you hold shift you can queue orders that means that he will run over here find the stosh troop that are here and attack them on site and then move up to this location and help us protect the bridge. Meanwhile this AT gun I'm going to have a normal move order to here and then we'll have him use a hunt order to the edge of the tree line so that he attacks anything that potentially comes up the road. Meanwhile we have bumped into a lot of tanks in the center. I've charged my T-34s forwards and you can see they're already under fire. My T-34-76-1943 here has taken a transmission damage. What that is, is a critical hit. And each critical has their own effect. I won't go through all of them in this tutorial, but I'll cover any that do pop up. We just broke the tracks of one of the Stug 3s. That means that he is immobile. He can still rotate, but can't move from that location. If transmission is destroyed that means they cannot rotate. So there is a different critical for each. Now if we select our tank here and hover over the enemy tank you can see that it does show us the distance to the target, the hit percentage and the penetration chance. In this case 71% chance to hit and 64% chance to penetrate. With AP rounds on tanks, generally the closer you are, the higher chance you have to penetrate. Also, for all units, the closer you are, the more accurate you will be. This unit has a loader wound and also a crew killed. The loader wounded is permanent and basically means that the tank will not load as quickly and the crew killed means that the Basically the tank cannot be used anymore so the loader got wounded and then the tank got crew killed so there's no crew there. In order to fix that up we're going to have to use supply. So if we click on the support tab here you can see that I have the supply vehicle. 
a supply truck. If I bring the supply truck up next to the tanks that have critical damage, I can fix them. But more on that later when it arrives. So I'm going to select a couple of mortars in the artillery tab and I'll also bring in uh, some planes. So I've got some IL-2s which are recon IL-2s and I've got two mortars here which I'm just going to unload straight away. So with artillery generally you can right click and that will aim and fire as normal but you can also use fire position in order to choose exactly where you want to put the mortar barrage and this is great for predicting where a unit is going to go or attacking concealed units. So for example this one's going to fire behind where the unit was when I gave the order whereas this one I've given a fire position order and if that unit had continued running forwards then we would be hitting the mark. And they will fire a number of rounds, in this case five. It varies based on the caliber of the unit. And those rounds will come down like so and help pin those units. Now you may have noticed this bar on top of units. And these guys are currently pinned down. So this red bar at the top is present for all units. So for example my T3476 here has the bar at the top. This shows how stressed the unit is. If the unit is a vehicle, they will automatically try and fall back. If it is an infantry unit or support weapon like an AT gun, then you have to manually give the order to fall back using the retreat button, which is by default R. The unit will then be labelled falling back instead of pinned down. Units will move very slowly while pinned down and cannot fire. They can also be surrendered if they are not in the radius of a discipline or leader unit and an enemy unit is within 100 meters. Furthermore, the enemy's front line needs to be covering those units. If the leader or discipline unit is also pinned down, the units will still surrender. Units suffering stress but not yet pinned or falling back can fire with reduced accuracy relative to how much they are stressed. Another thing I wanted to mention whilst the game is ongoing is the use of airplanes. So I purchased two of the IL-2 recon aircraft. I'm also going to purchase the Yak-9T and you'll see that they will appear in the bottom left of the screen. In order to bring them in, simply left click on them and right click where you would like them to come in on the map. If you would like to specifically attack a unit, simply right click on the unit. So for example, in this case, we're going to strafe the Avkala unit and my IL-2 will fly into position and attack that. We're still on half speed, by the way. If you want to cover the skies with a fighter, you can simply do so by having it fly about, and if any enemy aircraft come nearby, it will try and shoot it down. There is also another way you can use aircraft, and that is with the fire position command. So, for example, this IG-33 here, we'll pretend we've seen it, and now it's hidden. I can then change to the fire position command with my PE3 uh, bis here, and my plane will now come in and attack that, regardless of whether or not the unit is currently visible. If my plane had bombs or rockets, it would fire it at the position of my cursor. So I can completely fire off the mark. I could tell it to just fire at a random position on the floor. So for example, it's going to line up exactly where I told it to, and it's just going to fire at that position, even though there's nothing there. However, if you actually want it to fire out a unit, you can right click on the unit and it's going to strafe that building because there was an infantry unit there. My supply has arrived and when your supply is actually fixing stuff, it will come up with the blue spanner nearby. So after a little while, this T-3476 Comrotti will have its crew replenished and will be ready to go again. This transmission damaged uh, T-3476 is not being fixed up because it is currently in combat. Supply trucks will fix and resupply ammunition of anything in range as long as they are not falling back themselves. Supply is especially useful for resupplying artillery. Going back to artillery, I've shown you guys fire position with the T command, like so. You also have the B command. This is smoke. Smoke is really useful for blocking line of sight. So currently we can see this area fine. 
However, if I put down some smoke with this mortar, you will see that the line of sight changes. I'm just going to speed it up. And now that smoke is blocking line of sight. Smoke is very useful for giving cover for your infantry. So if there's a position that is defended, for example, if my T-34 here were an enemy tank and I wanted to advance towards it without being fired upon, I could smoke in front of it. And then the T-3476 would not be able to shoot at me. The other way you can do it is smoke the path in which your infantry are going to move. That way, if the tank moves forwards, your infantry will still be under smoke cover. Whereas if you smoke just in front of the tank, it can obviously just drive forwards through the, the smoke. So generally, if you, you would smoke closer to the enemy unit if it's immobile, uh, whereas if the enemy units are more mobile, like tanks, then you would smoke your own units or the path you wish to take with your own units. A little bit of a, a bonus tip here is if you want to like smoke the path all the way to these buildings, you can actually queue the smoke command and it will use all of its smoke rounds. It will fire five at each. Same goes for HE. So you can basically queue multiple smoke and HE fire support commands. Another useful tip for using artillery is to group them. You can group any unit in Steel Division 2 using the control key plus 1, 2, all the way up to 9. So, for example, if I want to add this mortar to group 1, I press control and 1, and that will be assigned to group 1. If I then select this mortar and do control and 2, that will be added to group 2. If I wish to select each group, I can press 1 and 2 respectively, and that will select those mortars, like so, without me having to click on them. Now this can be really useful, for example, if I put both of the mortars into the same group by putting them both in group 1, if I move to the front and I select my T-34, how am I supposed to select my mortars to get really fast fire support? Well, I can just press 1 if they're in a group, and then I can press T to bring in the fire support, just like that. And you can see that I've selected the mortars that are all the way at the back of the map, but can already bring in plenty of fire support nice and quickly. That's definitely something well worth knowing. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet are leaders. Leaders, they provide an extra veterancy to units around them. So in this case, this T-3476 Comrati gives its extra veterancy to these three tanks. So these would initially, if they're outside of the ring, have no veterancy. Leaders also prevent units from surrendering. Leaders can be identified by the star to the top left of their icon or the bottom left of the unit card. You can see the star disappears when they move outside the circle. Now, leader units cannot buff other leader units, but there is a way to make leader units more effective, and that is by bringing in a commander. So you can see here I have a commander unit coming in, the combat. And what that will do when they are in range of other leaders is give the leaders a bonus buff. Right, let's unload him where he is. And if I select my leader now, you'll see this line, which is currently dotted. And then there's a line here, all the way to the commander. That is the command range. If I move my T-34 into range of my commander, alongside a T-34, you'll see that this leader tank now gives two-star veterancy. So, the T-3476 will not become two-star, but you'll see that the T-3476 and this T-3476 will both gain now two-star veterancy instead of one. That is the benefit of having a commander, but they have to be in range. The initial range to a leader unit is 1,500 meters. So that's how far it has to be. You can see roughly if I use the line of sight tool, that's how far the range is. You can extend the range further by chaining command. So here is an example of the leaders connecting to each other. We have 
One of my leaders within the 1,500 meter range of the commander. And then from that position, you can move 1,000 meters from the connected leader and extend the command range. And each leader that is connected to this command will gain the same benefit, which is the two-star veteran C4 surrounding units and reduced suppression. If I move outside of the 1,000 meters, then we will lose that effect, as you can see. And it will show us by the dotted line and how far we need to be in order to get that bonus. You can create entire webs of these from one position if you're smart with the placement of your leader units. So why do you need veterancy or experience? Veterancy has different effects on different types of units. However, in general, high veterancy will make a unit more combat effective. From this point onwards, I'm going to consolidate my forces and I'll try and talk you through exactly what I'm going to do in order to win the game. So, we have 1,155 requisition points to spend. This is a lot. Uh, this is what we call floating points. Generally, you should use up most of your points every minute you have them come in. Now, I have put myself in a pretty tough position because my division is designed to win the game early on because otherwise my T-34s will bump into things like this Tiger E, for example, and be put in a very bad position. However, what I can do is overwhelm these larger pieces of armor. I can also bring in a lot of infantry that will be very difficult for the AI to dislodge. So here, I'm going to make use of the reverse command. You can see the Tiger was shooting at me. But I'm going to reverse away from it so I, so I show my front armor as I retreat. Right, meanwhile, I'm going to bring in some infantry. I'm holding shift and left clicking when bringing those in. And we're going to just take control of the, uh, the close range engagements. Another thing that's uh, cropped up here is these two units are currently behind the front line. And you're probably wondering how that happened. Well, if units manage to get all the way around your units, you will get surrounded. And now these guys will take extra suppression if they get attacked. Right, so the plan here is just to attack move across where that tiger is and take that out. We also need to clean up a lot of this infantry. I'm going to give fast move orders for these guys. Actually, we could probably just go unload at position commands near these trees. They will unload and then automatically try and run into the heavy cover because they have auto cover on. The AI is currently trying to use mortars against us. We could bring in our planes to go and spot that and strafe it. Is something that I'm going to do. I spotted a two-man squad ahead, so I'm going to unload my avtos and uh, have them like so. I have a couple avtos here. This one has an AT grenade. It's in range to throw it at the tiger, so we're going to allow it to do so. And hopefully we can get the kill. Yeah, we just overwhelmed that unit by charging it. Perfect. Going to use a quick hunt order with these four tanks. And we're going to zoom across here and hopefully make some ground. Meanwhile in the centre here, just going to try and unload these avtos into the building. And we'll try and kill these tiger tanks that are currently bullying my T-34s. There we go, we got into range with an AT grenade, we managed to kill it. That's good. Just got to do the same for that tiger and then we can spread out with hunt commands to go and hunt down the enemy units we're going to spread out select all the individual units and you can see I've given them these commands so now they will hunt in each direction 
until they find units to kill. And when they kill them, they'll continue moving. I'm going to do the same with my after Machiki. Now with infantry, it's a lot more apparent if they are using hunt that they go through cover. So for example, if I want to come all the way here, you'll see that it will use these trees, these trees, these trees, and these trees in order to get to its location. We have bumped into a pack 40. Right, we can get across the river here. You can see there's a couple positions where we can ford the river. And our troops will run to those positions and then hold their weapons above their head as they move across. Really cool animation. There we go. Very awesome indeed. I'm going to want to attack towards this pack 40. It might get one or two of these killed, but it's fine. Let's have my IL-2 come and attack that. I'm also going to have my plane come in off the edge of the map, and we will strafe the location where I previously saw that pack 40. And we've revealed it. I can just strafe it directly. That's a really good way to pin down assets like this pack 40. He did manage to bail out and gun jam some of my vehicles here. Bailed out is similar to crew killed, just quite simply the crew ran away and uh, therefore the tank is abandoned and gun jam, the tank can still move but it cannot fire anymore. So the best bet with those is to just move them back and get them fixed up. Luckily we captured a supply vehicle. Now, supply vehicles are the only vehicles in the game that can be captured and in this case we got into range of it and therefore we captured it. We currently have 15 objectives the AI currently has 9 which is going to give the AI a minor defeat in 10 minutes and 50 seconds. Now, as a quick tip, these Abtomachiki, these guys are really good at close range since they use majority submachine guns. I also have the Strauki that I brought in earlier, the Strauki with the DPs. These are better at longer ranges because they use rifles and machine guns. At a glance, that's a, an easy way to identify. Here we can demonstrate a surrender. Since he's falling back and his bar is full, if I move a unit close enough to him, he will surrender. And that is because our front line pushed over him. He's technically behind our lines now. He's not going to fight on. But the bar, the red bar, has to be full in order for that to happen. You can tell a unit to fall back before it has a full bar. Over halfway full, you can start to fall back. I am going to have to find a way to deal with that tiger. Let's have my close range infantry move up. Hopefully we can use those AT grenades to take them out. We have spotted a pack 40. That's going to end up killing my T-3476 most likely, unless I can strafe it in time. There we go. Pack 40 down. And our T-34 managed to survive somehow. Oh, not for long. Now I thought I'd take this time to mention a little bit about combined arms. You can see in this battle so far I've been using mostly tanks and infantry with a little bit of air support. In most games you're going to be wanting to use all types of units, especially in multiplayer. Make sure to check out my multiplayer gameplay videos to see this in action. And the reason I like this division so much is it's very stereotypical Soviet in a sense that you do just throw units at the enemy in order to make ground regardless of the amount of losses you take. So in this game we have taken quite a lot of losses but we hold the ground that we want to and that's the main thing. You win the game by holding the ground not by having a good kill death ratio. And Gruppe Turin 
is one of the best for that. Another thing to mention is ammo count. At the bottom of the screen you can see a unit's reloading. The top of their icon also showing the same thing. Underneath their reloading bar you can see the number of shells they have, either AP or HE shells in this case. As they fire any gun, units will use up ammunition. When they run out of ammunition, they need to be resupplied by a supply truck. Every unit in the game uses ammunition of some sort. Planes are reloaded off the map and do not require any supply. Let's try and kill this tiger by getting close with the Aftermatchiki. We are in range with the heat. Lovely. So there is only 1 minute and 20 seconds left until we have victory. You can see we are now well into phase C. And when we reach phase C, the timer changes from time left in the phase to time elapsed showing you the total game time. And there you have it, we've won the game after 30 minutes and 27 seconds, holding 18 of the objectives at the end of the game. If we jump into the team statistics, we can see the kills and losses. You also have chronology, which shows you the order in which all units died across the game. You've got your kills, so you can see which units did the best in the game. And it's really good to see sometimes some of the MB MVPs of your battles. There's also losses, so you can see what really did the most damage to your units. And in this case, this pack 40 killed off five of my T-34 76s. This would be due to either lack of recon or lack of infantry support for my tanks. But that balance is something that you'll definitely learn as you play the game more. Anyway, that's it from me. Hopefully you guys are happy now to jump into a game and give it a go yourselves. Let me know how you get on in the comments and if you have any further questions, make sure to leave them there as well. I'm sure people will be more than happy to help you out on the discords that are available. There is my own, there is the official Still Division 2 Discord, and there is also the Still Division League Discord. I'll leave all the links to those in the description. Furthermore, if you want the codes to the battle groups you saw today, make sure to check out the Google Doc that will be linked below. The next tutorial will be understanding the armory, so make sure to check that out. And then we'll be moving on to advanced gameplay mechanics, as well as how to make your own battle group. Until then, hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. Hopefully this has been useful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.